All right. So before we start, this is Security Tester's Toolbox. If you're in the wrong room, feel free to leave screaming right now. There's no problem. Uh, a little bit about me. This is a level one, or a little bit about this talk. This is level, I rate this at 200 to 400 going on insanity. Um, I like to kind of suggest to people that this is, there's a, a lot of command line tools in this, uh, black screens, typing, old school kind of DOS and bash scripts and things like that. So if that confuses you, good. Because it'll make me look more smart than I really am. All right, okay, this is Security Tester's Toolbox. Let's see, why isn't, oh yeah, well, you know what? This is always a presenter's nightmare. They're wondering why the little clicky mouse is not working. It helps if you turn these things on. Ta-da. Clicky mouse now works. All right, I am Niall Merrigan. I am a managing consultant with Capgemini in Stavanger in Norway, all the way up from up north. And if you are wondering why the Norwegian sounds a bit like a paddy, it's because I'm from Ireland and I just kind of got lost in Norway just due to various reasons. I'm an MVP um, in DevTools and I'm an ASP Insider, Azure Advisor. And if you ever find me inside in the Baxter's Inn, that absolute mecca in this country, the last line is very appropriate. I approve. My, my name when you meet me in the bar is like, what are you having? So it'll, <laughs> quite nice. You can tweet me at nmerrigan. I'm at nile.merrigan.no. You can please visit my company's website to show your appreciation of how awesome it was to let me down here uh, for a couple of days. And you can also, if you are a bit masochistic, uh, you can go visit my very dated website. I do put a lot of links and stuff up there for different tools I work with, but you know. So this is a security testers toolbox. And this is the one where I teach you how to do the black hat style of attacks against your neighbors, against your family, against your coworkers. I mean, hang on a second, we're recording crap. Um, <laughs> Don't do this at home. I mean, do this at home. Don't do this in work, because your boss will get really pissed off. Um, a funny story, I have the title Hacker in Residence inside in Capgemini and Stavanger, because I figured out how to SQLI it into the database and job titles, and my boss doesn't know how to fix it. Um, it's a great way to get a promotion. Right, why on, whoa, whoa. Why on earth am I going to show you how to sniff Wi-Fi, how to crack open Wi-Fi, how to write malware, how to do man-in-the-middle attacks against banks? Because I am a true believer of the following motto. You can only fight the way you practice. Because if you do not understand the types of attacks that can be used against your applications and used against your network, you will not truly understand why there's a little hacker running around inside your, in your network like a demented gerbil. Now, funny story, there was a hack recently where a guy managed to pop the dom domain controller for a network. Domain controller is where you store all the usernames and passwords and all domain credentials for all of your employees usually considered the golden throne of the network. And someone decided to install a Bitcoin miner in there rather than actually doing something good. So the thing is, I like, how many of you play sports? How many of you play like um, uh, fight, or I wouldn't say play fighting, but like do kind of uh, martial arts? Anyone here do any of that? A couple of people, right. Normally when you see boxers and people who do martial arts, they box against the bag to get fit. They box against their mates to learn how to take a hit and anticipate the punch. The same way when you learn to drive a car. It's all well and good driving in Forza around uh, some like the Nuremberg ring, but when you want to go out and get milk for, for granny, it's not the same experience. Unless you're driving with Troy Hunt. <laughs> <laughs> I have another story on that. Anyway. This guy is a Japanese uh, swordsman from the 1600s, and he did, and I love this, this, the quote for it, it is just exceptionally good, but it does tell you why I'm going to show you some of the things that people consider very bad things to know. Now, um, I'm going to discuss a lot about strategy and what way it works. You have recon. The reconnaissance phase is where you go out and you kind of figure out how am I going to attack this, what type of vulnerabilities does this system have, uh, what is the weakest point into any single system. So I'm going to pose a question to an Australian audience. This is always a bit of a gamble when you do it in Norway. Generally, you get it just like crickets. So I'm hoping, like, well, and if you get crickets in Australia, I'm pretty sure they'll kill you. Um, <laughs> so uh, where was I going with this? Yeah. What is the weakest point in any system? 
Thank you. And to repeat for the people playing at home, he said, people, um, in my very Aussie accent. <laughs> Uh, I get to have a lot of fun down here. Um, yes, people are the weakest link because they are very, very vulnerable to things like Irish people going, sure, I can help you with your internet. That's no problem. <laughs> Just plug this in. C goofy thing. How many of you um, use Facebook? A lot of people use Facebook. Anyone ha not have friends on Facebook? That's OK. Um, anyone not heard of the internet? Actually, this is Australia. Um, it's a really cool. <laughs> Uh, so all of a sudden, those green cards are just like being ripped up, thrown away. Anyway, if you go into Chrome, OK, pretty cool thing. If you go into Chrome, you press F12 in on the Facebook page and go to console. It has a big thing called, stop, don't do this. Don't copy and paste in what your mate said you should do. OK, so that's a pretty cool thing. Um, that's, what, that's because they found out people were being stupid. So they saw, OK, that's how we fix this. Now. I'm also going to show you some of the exploitation techniques, what we can do, like creating some malware, uh, taking over a box, uh, doing a bit of Wi-Fi pwnage, uh, general kind of all good, clean fun. Nothing serious, except this very important notice. For the love of God, do not do this in public like I'm about to do. Um, the simple thing is, this, all these techniques are on the verge of, uh, Your Honor, um, I'm really sorry I didn't think that would happen. Uh, type of things. So don't do this at home, or do this at home. Do it on systems you own. Don't do it against systems you don't own, or don't have permission to do it against. Please do not use these things like to um, annoy your boss and try and get him to give you a pay rise, because it doesn't work. Uh, <laughs> But I'm serious. This is the, the, the dark stuff. It, you don't want to be caught doing this. Uh, if you really want to just uh, make, look, make yourself look cool at an airport, use Hacker Typer or something, and everyone kind of thinks you're awesome. And if you haven't tried Google Hacker Typer, it's pretty, pretty cool. And I found out there's a, this morning that there is an awesome little uh, kind of um, uh, Easter egg in it. If you use Caps Lock three times, it gives up Access Denied in a big green kind of red letters. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, red alert. And if you use Alt, I think, three times, it goes access granted. And at that point, you go, yeah. <laughs> so I can be, <laughs> well, I seriously think you should do that in a, in a hotel and just like sit around, Mac. And you know you've got all got black hoodies now. Yeah, there you go. There's the gentleman. It's all it's like everyone suddenly has all gone black hat. <laughs> yeah. How are you doing? Doing nothing. <laughs> so what I'm going to show you today. This is going to be a little tour of all crazy things. We've got Kali Linux, which is a Debian-based, uh, Linux-based operating system. It is armed to the proverbial teeth with tools. It comes out of the box with about 1,000 different tools you can use to do any number of different things. It includes recon, information gathering, uh, web proxy attacks, or web attacks, um, everything you could possibly need to go into in a nice bag of tools. Um, some of the things I'm going to show you as well is like Nmap, which is a network mapper. Um, this is a really cool tool. How many of you like have stayed in hotels? Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> I do this a lot. But you know what the first thing is when you get onto the Wi-Fi or whatever? I run Nmap to see what's around. Now, it's, everyone kind of thinks that's a really bad thing to do. But I'm always wondering what other idiot is on with me. Because when I want to stream Netflix, it makes it much easier if I can just knock them off. You know, you, get a, you can get a better share of the pipe. <laughs> But I have found things like cash registers on this, on the guest nets for some strange reason. I don't understand why. Um, usually probably because someone went, oh, that's a correct port. Plug it in. It works. Yay. Um, I'm not going to show beef. I might show beef, but I don't know yet. But um, we have a thing down here called Metasploit. Metasploit is the granddaddy of exploitation tools. It is pretty awesome. Everything that you can imagine um, that can be exploited, it has a module for. So it does a lot of the remote tools. And it also acts as a listener and sends out like remote Trojans and stuff. It is exceptionally powerful. If this ends up inside in some of your applications, um, it, it's really game over. Then I'm going to show you like the Veil framework, which is a um, antivirus avoidance uh, technology. Um, that is written with uh, five other tools. It's called what is known as the Veil um, framework. Comes a thing called Veil Evasion for AV, avo uh, AV avoidance. Um, there's one called Veil Catapult for launching your applications into like SMB shares. Uh, there's Veil Ordnance for creating uh, weaponry. There's um, I think Power Splice for doing PowerShell um, exploitation. Ladies and gentlemen, the best thing on a Windows machine is PowerShell. It is a hacker's best friend. There are 16 ways to break out of UAC with PowerShell. 
okay? Now, I want to know something cool. So I'm going to give you a very cool little thing. How is, you ever have a GPO, group policy, and it says this program is not allowed to be run, right? You ever get that? Do you want to know how to bypass that? Zip the file. And seriously, zip the file, okay? Open the file in the zip file and just double click it. It will load it into memory. It won't have the same signature, same access point, and GPO will go, eh, it's fine. It's how I got to get putty warning one day when I couldn't, wasn't allowed to use it. So I'm serious. This is a very, very simple way of doing it. Um, and I will show you, may show you Beef, which is a browser exploitation framework. It's an XSS framework, which allows you to insert random JS hooks into things and do all sorts of mad, crazy things like inject Clippy onto someone's friends, your friend's page. Because you know, no one really likes to see Clippy turning up on their page. It looks like you're trying to hack this site. Can I help? <laughs> now, right. If I didn't, if you weren't, if you arrived late or you're just have a memory of a goldfish like the rest of us, again, public service announcement. Do not do this in public, like I'm about to do, as I said. Do this at home, okay? Please. I like cats. They like you. Um, and you like staying out of jail because, you know what they say, don't drop the soap. Um, so, yeah, uh, the, the, again, this is being recorded and I'll remember that. Okay, demos. Let's have some fun. Uh, because, you know, there's nothing more fun than hoping to God everything works. <sighs> right. So let's start with here. Now, I'm going to start a little bit. Uh, if you, can you see that? You can. Great. So you are deciding you want to hack something. You've woken up one morning, you've had your Wheaties or Vegemite or whatever demon, on, demon thing that, that they call that. Seriously, kids, Vegemite. It's another example of the, of the Australian natives trying to kill you. <laughs> here, you want this thing on toast? Honestly, I swear. So what have we got here? We have the CVE database. CVE, uh, Common uh, Vulnerabilities and Exposures Database. This is where all good things come to start and play and live. The CVE database is when you get like a CVE number and it says that we are recognizing that you have a bug or a vulnerability in your application. Awesome. Uh, oh, I missed it. Try again, come on. That's so natural. Um, <laughs> you have the National Vulnerability Database, right? So what you get is you get a CVE database, a CVE link. This is usually what happens when you get like a 2016 dash dash and this is the, uh, where they say, right, you now have a vulnerability in your application and you possibly have produced a, either a fix for it already. On average, there was, in 2015, there was 7,000-ish, 8,000-ish CVEs registered. Of those, 7,988 of those was flash. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> PSA number two, disable flash on your browser. Now, and followed very closely by Java. Because we all know what Java stands for, don't we? Just another vulnerability, actually. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Spot the Microsoft guy. Anyway, so, <laughs> so we will look at a CVE number, 2015-003. And this was the Win32 case sys in kernel mode drivers and windows, blah, 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 AKA Win32k elevation of privilege vulnerability. This is awesome. It tells you absolutely nothing of why this is a problem. It just says, there is a bug. And you know what happens when some developer gets a, there is a bug um, in their code? Like, you know, if you've ever got a bug report that says, someone says, there's a bug, I will email back saying, there's a solution. <laughs> and see how this, this conversation goes. Because usually that's where people are kind of like, oh, fine, I'll tell you what I did. So then we have what is known as the National uh, Cyber Awareness System. And NIST is the National Vulnerability D Database. And what this does, I might just minimize it and move down to less uh, blind view. And what this does is this gives you a better overview of what the um, vulnerability was. So in this case, it's the same nearly replication. It's got the same text, but it tells you how bad this thing was. So it's got a CVSS version 2 score of 6.9, which means medium. And the reason it's got a medium, it's got an impact subscore of 10, meaning quite possibly the most lethal thing outside of Australia. Now, and then it has an exploitability. Yeah, every time I try and say that, I just make a 
It's got an exploit subscore of 3.4. So these two numbers magically put together give you 6.9 for some reason. I don't know how, but it just does. Anyway, then it means the reason is it says because it's locally exploitable, victim must voluntarily interact with the attack mechanism. Ladies and gentlemen, how do you get someone to interact with an attack mechanism? You make them double click it, i.e. it had to be a bug or something that was put on a piece of, uh, or put on a page or downloaded or you'd infect something. And then that's the reason why this was a problem because it allows you to uh, uh, gain uh, like a golden ticket or sorry, not a golden ticket, of elevation of, of uh, permissions. So you now know there's a bug in your system. You now know there's a good uh, NIST uh, declaration of what's wrong. Where do you go next? You go to the very aptly named exploit database because nothing says better than database. And what this does, can you see that? Actually, we'll try again. What this is, is maintained by a company called Offensive Security. And what they do is they host about, as they say, 35,484 exploits. And what you have here is all the different types of exploits that are available for you to play with and download and use. So you've got things like remote exploits, web application exploits, local and privileged expo escalation exploits, proof of concepts, and some shell code, and also uh, archive security papers. One of the things I like to point out here in web application exploits, if we just zoom a little bit here, all right? How many of you are web developers? Quite a lot, okay. All right, you notice the big words here. Where is it gone? Am I, can I, am I blind? I see SQL injection a lot, I think. Do I am reading the right place here? Stored XSS, SQL injection, CSERF, and other different things. But SQL I, in general, is still a huge problem because Developers don't get it. Apostrophes are important. Okay? Irish people know how to write SQL injectable proof code. <laughs> you notice how I'm saying this very deadpan? <laughs> because I used to, te I used to uh, teach in university, and you'd always find the guy who's got a, uh, someone in our group which had a guy named O'Connell, O'Donnell, and had the apostrophe, because they would find this very quickly and get this unescaped problem. So they would, they would automatically escape their code. But SQL I is still very, 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 very prevalent. And I, I, one thing I'm, I'm loathe, and kind of I do like giving a dash at it sometimes, there's quite a lot of PHP still, OK? Now, that, it's not a dig at PHP as a framework. It's a dig at PHP as it is very low friction to get into it. So it's free, there's a lot of good, there's a lot of sample code out there, people just copy paste. Um, I think Troy did a thing earlier on where people just copy stuff from Stack Overflow, chuck it in, the code works, yay, I can go home. And this happens a lot. And PHP is still predominantly the most um, exploited piece of code. Um, you can read into what, what you want. But if we go back to our guy here, and this is the MS1510, this is the proof of con or this is the local privilege escalation code that is exploitable. So you just have to inject this in some way into an executable, get this to run, and boom, you have admin rights. I like it. So you have very little work to do. Now, if you want to go and find types of machines that are vulnerable to this, you can use a thing called Shodan. And Shodan, if we go back to the page and everything closely works, and I'm tethered still, awesome, internet works. Um, this is a search engine for the Internet of Things, labeled as the most dangerous search engine in the world ever. Um, it is very, very cool. What this does is it's written by a guy in Germany called John Matherly, and what he's done is he's got a load of spiders that run around the Internet and figure out ports and tell you what's running on them. So I'm going to open this up and I ask, I'm going to ask a question. How long do you think it takes to scan all the Internet for 4 billion addresses? Not from Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Australia, mate, it's got like, you talk like a boomerang. Um, how long do you think it takes to scan the internet? Anyone willing to, like, less than a day. Well, we're good. That's a good start. Arbitrary number, less than a day. It's like how long I'm going to tell my wife it's how it's going to take to clean the house. <laughs> Next. Hour. Hour. Go lower. Half an hour, go a little bit lower. 28 minutes. That was in 2014 at DEF CON. The guys did it live with mass scan. All right, 28 minutes. They have it down now to two and a half. You do need 
couple of gigabit NICs or possibly 10 gigabit NICs and a pipe the size of Google's to do it, but it is possible. So the inference by that is it takes two and a half minutes to find a machine you have spun up without patches. All right? If you're running in Azure or AWS or any of the other cloud providers and you spin up a machine, you've got two and a half minutes to wrap it, baby. Otherwise, a lot of very dangerous spiders are going to come licking it. All right? It is crazy. So what this does is it goes scanning and downloads all the banners, has a ton of information. And you can go looking for things like Windows Server 2003, Windows XP, all machines that are out of date, vulnerable, and probably out of security patching. Because the problem is many developers, what they'll do is they'll launch up an application, it's into production, and that's it done. We, won't, we don't need to do maintenance, do we? It's done. It's fixed. Software doesn't evolve like Pokemon. It just sits there like my Pidgey. <laughs> Um, have you done the Pokemon around here? There's just nothing but Zubats. It's ridiculous. Um, but also, apparently, there's a whole thing. If you go on to, this is why I love being a programmer sometimes. <laughs> if you go on to GitHub, there's a thing called Necrobot, which will go around the world catching all the Pokemon for you. So you just sit there and let it off. And it is, there's apparently a thing where it says it's currently walking from Cornwall to John O'Groats or something all the way up in, in England so you can get all your eggs done. The bot, it's brilliant. <laughs> Programmers always looking for solutions. <laughs> Now, to go do something like this, we are going to look at things like we can go looking for databases. Because you know, what lives inside in databases? Data, it's awesome. Um, passwords, things, other things I like. And if I go looking for MongoDB databases, I can find this type of thing. And I'm gonna explain this a bit more tomorrow. But I've got, you can go, because Mongo up until about 1.4. something decided that security was an optional extra. <laughs> And it was listening on all ports, and it wasn't secured. And I'm very, I'm probably the reason it is this is because you know, no SQL, no no query, we can't get data out. Doesn't matter, you know, who's going to find anything? So that is a very cool way. I'll show a lot of showdown tomorrow. If you come to my talk tomorrow, I've got a ton of things that'll just make your jaws drop. Now, you can also go things like looking for like this, like uh, port 92000 JSON, which is more, um, I think, is Elasticsearch, looking for specific ones. Um, you can do this for like Redis. Uh, um, Elasticsearch, any other different caching services, and people have left these devices open, be, or applications running uh, with unauthentication be, or no authentication, because they, real, they don't think it can be found. How difficult is an IP to guess? You know, it's, four, it's just uh, four octets, you're done. Now, if you're in the kind of mood to attack a website, um, let's see if this works. Give me a second. Right, there we go. If you're in the mood to attack a website, you know, you're sitting on the couch, you've just watched CSI Cyber, and you're thinking, I can do that. Um, you can use Punk Spider. Punk Spider is a little bit out of date at the moment, but it's pretty freaking awesome still. It is, I love this. The goal is to provide free information to website users and owners regarding website security status. We take this very seriously. Use it wisely, or we'll have to take it away. So remember that. We just click accept, because I haven't read that. And what you can do is you can go looking for different domains and different types of structures. And, you can, and what it allows you to do is look for, like, for example, blind SQL injection, SQL injection, cross-site scripting, traversal, um, uh, XPath injection, for example. And you can go find websites uh, who have this. And it actually even generates a nice URL for you to use. So you can see said SQL injection in play. Now, one of the simplest ways to go find SQL injectable sites is to just go off and use Google and use a nice Google dork. The very nice guys at the Exploit database have even got a Google hacking database with a ton of Google dorks in there. And it just, it's just insane. So I'm going to give you a piece of advice as I give to a lot of developers and programmers. Um, how many of you use build servers? A couple of people, great. How many of you are internet connected, outside, available uh, online, everywhere else? One or two. Have you ever Googled four? build servers login screens? Because you can find a ton of unauthenticated build servers all right, that allow you to do things to them. They will accept whatever you give them. You can change how the code is deployed. You can change what the code does. You can inject your own code. And this is the, the problem that people are there going, no one will find it. Google finds everything. And you don't lie to Google. You know, it knows all your habits. So one of the big problems is that people need to remember that even though I, it's not, it's security by security is not a security um, procedure. It is much, it's, it's this equivalent of my son when he goes playing hide and seek and he hides and his ass is out of the, out of the, um, the bed and he's giggling away, good old, and he's thinking, Papa can't see me because I can't see him. 
All right, so don't be my four-year-old son because that is just really weird. If you want to see XSS in action, go to the Open Bug Bounty program. Now, these guys, what they're doing is absolutely insane. They are hunting bugs at a rate of knots and trying to get paid for it. So bug bounties are very popular. XSS is a very, still very, very uh, huge. A lot of vulnerabilities there. Um, you can see by a lot of the kind of websites, quickest patch, one minute, latest submissions. They used to have their kind of the Alexa top 200. LinkedIn was on top there, Yahoo, et cetera, all these different sites. And it was in the last month that they were still being accessed. Um, what they do is they do responsible disclosure, very cool. Once you go in, you can actually look at the XSS vulnerability, see how it was done, see how the person has finished it. Um, we did a talk back in January in Oslo, myself, Troy, and a couple of other um, guys, and some, we were using Slido, um, little kind of uh, to do the presentations, and we were talking about uh, different things, and one of the guys went through the XSS cheat sheet, which uh, is not 15 things, it's about 115 things of way of doing XSS bypass, and managed to do XSS live on stage to this tool we were using. So that's, it, it still exists. Now, let's show you a bit of Kali. Let's do this. Hello, Kali. Wiki, wiki. So this is Kali, uh, very secure password. It's the default instance. Yes. All right. Uh, nope. Okay. It's the default instance. You can download Kali today from the Kali website. It's about a seven, no, is it about between two and a four meg or gig uh, torrent file? And it's the quickest way to get it down. It's zipped, and then it expands, and it, you download. You can ex use it in VMware. It runs very, very quickly. It really, really powerful. I'm just going to start. I'm just going to minimize this from the screen, so you don't see what's going on and get confused. Kali has a default username of root and a default password of tour. This version is only on my NAT, so you don't can't get access to it. But if you do put it publicly, change the SSH keys, change everything, because someone will just go, yeah, 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 wee, and you will be locked out of your Kali machine. Now, Kali is exceptionally powerful. It comes with a ton of things out of the box, in, like as this, you can see here, information gathering, vulnerability analysis, web application analysis, database assessment, password attacks, wireless attacks, reverse engineering, and so on. And what I'm going to show you here is some of the crazy things we can do. Now, I have, have you ever used, if you've never used Nmap, Nmap makes reg, regex look sane when it comes to its command line switches, okay? And there's a couple of people who are there going, I, I'm giggling, other people are going, what's a regex? And they're the lucky ones. Because <laughs> the rest of us are like, <laughs> make it go away, man. Um, so what we can do here is if you want to learn how the command line switches work, you can use a thing called ZenMap. And ZenMap does a really good job of showing how like, the command line switches work. So if you want to do a uh, in quick, uh, what is it, quick scan plus, it's like you know, minus S lower, or minus lowercase s, v, minus t4, minus o, minus f, dash dash version light, because that is very obvious as why that would be a good thing. And you can just put in the IP addresses and it scans it off for you. And what we can do here is just turn in 192, yeah, this one. And we'll see how long this takes, because it could take a little bit. And this will give me the list of different devices on my network, what they're running, the services they're running, and possibly an OS as well, if it can determine it. Now, how many of you have thought the hotel Wi-Fi is a bit shocking today? Honestly, it's not my fault. Well, actually, it might be, a little bit. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a Nano, and it is a Wi-Fi pineapple. It's one of the baby brothers of the little Nano. Now, the reason it's got really giant aerials is they give you this deeny weeny aerial, and I'm going to do the only joke I've prepared for this. That's not an aerial. <laughs> this is an aerial. <laughs> I honestly thought if I did that with a spoon, would anyone get it? <laughs> I see you've played Knifey Spoonie before then. Oh, my favorite episode of The Simpsons by a long shot. Even the Irish piss take doesn't match it. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so what this does is it is a very cool little device. Um, mainly because it's got a giant battery pack on it and I've got two giant aerials. Uh, what this does is it acts like a uh, router, or um, I, I'm loath to say router because you'll all giggle like little boys, because apparently that's a naughty word in Norway, or no, in Australia. Um, but so what you do is this how Wi Fi works. You want the little Wi Fi primer, all right? Back in the days when Wi Fi was new, 
everyone said, how do we find if the router is up? So they said, well, get your device to shout out everything it knows. And if someone's listening for that name, it'll shout back. They'll do the handshake, and we're good. And someone says, that's awesome. That's really cool. And the problem is, we ended, they used to only have like five routers in the world. So it was fine. You know, those five guys with Wi-Fi. But after a while, you know, people said, well, you know, this thing is at home. I've got Wi-Fi at home. You know what they say about home? Uh, it's the place where your Wi-Fi connects automatically. Um, <laughs> All right. <laughs> see, I, 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 you know, come on. <laughs> Wait till you see me at PubConf, man. I swear to God, much more crazy. Anyway, you do this, and what they said is, well, what we're going to do is we're going to make the devices a bit more battery uh, focused, and we're not going to shout out all the different things. We're going to listen for all the different uh, Wi-Fi points, and if we recognize one of them, we'll shout out, we know you, and connect. So what this does now, originally this used to just like listen for all the broadcasts and reply yes when you said, are you an honors at Hilton? Are you like a Netgear? It didn't matter. It would just say yes. Very easy router. Writer. Router. Anyway, um, <laughs> then what happened was, it, when the new thing is, they said, right, what you're going to do is I'm going to listen for all the different broadcasts of SSIDs you have and add them to a list and start broadcasting them back out. So now, all of a sudden, if you're looking at your devices, you will see possibly in the region of two to 3,000 different SSIDs that are broadcasting from this little device. And it makes it very difficult to figure out which open network you want to connect to. You have a 1 in 3,000 chance of getting it right. And, all I, and your devices are very, very good at just going, oh, I like you, and connect. Now, the problem is that this is just one of the small ones. I have a Tetra, which is its bigger brother, has four of the aerials on it, also does a five gigahertz range. Now, these things are very good because they do pass-throughs. They allow you to uh, sniff uh, different devices, et cetera. But it means if someone's on, on your network here, if I've got you connected, I'm routing out towards out to the web from here, I control everything that happens at this point. Because this is the question. When you go on to a hotel network, do you know what they're listening to, if they're listening? what they're changing. Use a VPN, kids. It's the safe way to do it. Now, because otherwise you're going through this, and I swear to god, you're not going to like it. Anyway, I'm going to turn this off in a minute. Just now you know it's there. I did tell the other speakers that your Wi-Fi will go a bit dicky while I'm working. And they just <laughs> and they're like, oh, god damn, man. So now we have this, res um, this Nmap uh, returned. We can see here what the different uh, servers are running, our computers are running on the network. I've got about five. It includes the gateway. We've got here 128.28.2. This is my um, Kali box. And then I've got a box here which is um, Metasploitable. And it's got a great name called Metasploitable because it is very exploitable. It's a training box. It is as secure as Swiss cheese. Lots of holes, lots of things to play with. You can see the different number ports open. You can download this from the internet. It's very, very quick to play up with. Do not, for the love of God, leave it on the internet because it will just become a hub for people hosting other things. Now, you'll also see this one, 131, and this is Windows. So if we look at the host details, it just says it's Windows. It has fairly secure because it's Windows 10, 15, 11. Um, which makes my job a little bit difficult to demo. And I don't really want to bring a Windows XP box in here because that's just like cheating. Um, so I do, take a, I do take pride in having to try to do the other ones. Now, one of the cool things is that's using Nmap to try and find different vulnerable devices. You can use a, another network card, like these alphas, with this other little aerial. Um, I just got excited. And what you'll do here is the alpha is a very specific chipset. It allows it to go into a thing called monitor mode. And what will happen is most devices, what, when you have them, what they do is they just look for networks and they don't bother listening for all the different type of traffic. What we do this is in to go into eavesdropping mode. And you have to have specific drivers to do it. Most Intel cards won't work. Certain rail link cards and these alphas. That is a $20 card. Um, when I plugged this in, I was away up on the uh, 38th floor or something. And I plugged this in. And I can see like the tower and I can see the QVB. And I was picking up all the... TVs around me uh, when I was doing my sniffing, and I was also picking up the QVB Wi-Fi, which was a good 80 to 200 meters away through concrete and glass. So these things are very, very powerful. And what you can do with it to do this is quite simple. You just have to do airmon, ng, check, and use kill. Now this very simple command, what it does, it nukes all the different networking so that you don't have to worry about what's going on. 
So there will be no interference on the different networking uh, subsystems. And then you just do airmon ng, and I think it starts WLAN 0. Is it WLAN 0? Yeah. And all this will do is it'll turn it into monitor mode. And what we're going to do now is we're going to see what type of devices and things are listening and shouting out for stuff around here. We'll see what will happen. God knows. Could be anything crazy. So we're going to do a thing called aero dump. Um, minus I, WLAN 1, 0, or sorry, mon. So what it has done is it, it adds a prefix or suffix onto the name and gives it mon. And then we're just going to do dash dash manufacturer, because I want to show you something, and dash dash WPS. I'm going to do full screen. I'm going to see how long this takes. Hopefully, we'll find something. Did I do the right thing? W0 mon minus I. We should find something. Otherwise, I have a very poor demo. It even should pick up the Wi Fi router, router whatever's going on. All right, let's have a quick look. Dun, dun. Uh, stop. WLAN 0, mon. Might be just a something's gone a bit funky. If not, I will just pray and I'll just tell you what really happens. Eh, never mind. Okay, we will. <laughs> every time I try and do this demo at up upstairs, it works fine. Every time I do it down here, it breaks. So I might take this out of the cycle. Right. Let me explain with the, through the um, in uh, what was it called uh, interpretive dance how this works. Uh, <laughs> what happens is this goes into monitor mode. It'll tell you what's going wrong, uh, what's happening. The first six digits of every single MAC address tells you which is the manufacturer of the device. Okay, did you know that? First six digits of your MAC address tells you which is the manufacturer of your device. So you use a w dash dash manufacturer to find out what version of the router it is. And then you have a thing called WPS. Everyone heard of WPS? Wi-Fi protected setup. It's an invention because people are stupid and think passwords are hard. And what that happened was it was because after a while WEP, which is wireless encryption protocol, was v deemed to be exceptionally easy to crack. It is stupidly simple to break. And then they came up with WPA and WPA2. But people thought passwords were hard at this point. And to make life simpler and devices easier to connect, they said, well, you just press a button here, you press a button here, and the two devices will talk to each other. What happens is it sends a pin over, and your router will send back the Wi-Fi address, and it will just load it, or the Wi-Fi password will load it back in. Certain devices are vulnerable to repeated WPS attacks making it that you only need 11,000 combinations to match up and get the WPS pin of a router. What's even cooler is there is a chipset problem, meaning it only takes two WPS attacks to do it. And it's called pixie dust. And this is affecting Belkin and certain D-Links and certain other Broadcom um, devices. It means you can crack open a router in less than a minute, and it will send you the pin which will you then send the pin back, and it will send you back over the password. They find out you're on your network. They change the password. You send back the pin. It sends you back the new password. It's a very simple system. <laughs> Use a device called Reaver, and it is very, very powerful. So if you are using WPS at home and you are technically savvy and not an idiot, turn it off because you don't want someone just going ping, 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 and they will get eventually. It takes about between four to six hours, depending on the speed of your router and how quickly it has, if it has flood detection or not. So turn off WPS, because otherwise, people like me, I have found WPS in corporate environments. And when I do that, I just go and then it hands me over the password. I'm like, here you go. And they're going, how did you get our Wi-Fi password? I always want to say I asked the CEO just to see what happens. <laughs> I asked the, C the CEO, CIO, somebody you know, with technical levels or something, which is a bit of fun. So at this point, we've done our Wi-Fi recon. We've done other things. We're now kind of near the network. We're, I'm assuming we're going to be on the network. And what we're going to do is we're going to look and see what we can break here. And what I want to try and do is uh, I'm looking here on the ports. And I noticed something on the FTP. It's got VSFTPDD 2.3.4. Now, the reason it has that very specific version number is for demo purposes, it's awesome because it's very vulnerable to an attack. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fire up Metasploit, and I'm just going to do MSF console. And this will take a little bit of time. And MSF console is the command line interface to Metasploit. And it does take a quite a bit of time. There we go. Now, once this is up, I will show you how to exploit my Metasploitable box. Is it is very, very cool and very, very simple. Starting the Metasploit, jeez. There we go. So 
I tell people when they start this, the first thing you do is type in banner a couple of times so you can get the eventually get the metasploitable cow, which is pretty cool. I'm not going to do that because it does take a random amount of time how long it takes. So if I just do help here, I can see the different type of commands I can run. And I can see up a little bit, I think, here. It has a lot of different things here. And I can go, I'm just going to use a specific command because I know it works, exploits. And it's Linux. And it's FTP. And oh no, is it Unix? Sorry. Um, FTP and it's VS FTP 2.3.4 backdoor. You would think I would have written this demo. You press return, you type info, and you get this thing here and it says this module exploits a malicious backdoor that was added to the VS FTP download archive. The backdoor was introduced between this, the 30th of June 20, 2011, and July 1st, 2011. So you have a limited amount of time where someone has not downloaded the update for this. But people will have just installed the software, think it's good, realize what we can do, and just go, meh. And you know, how many people, quick question, how many of you update the firmware to your router very often, as often as possible? Why don't you do it more often? Laziness? It's not obvious, really, is it? Also, it's like, you know, I've got to reset up all the passwords, I've got to do the backup, I've got to do this. Uh, it's, it's fine, no one will find me on the internet. <laughs> Two and a half minutes later, boom. Uh, right, so what I want to try and do here is do what it needs to run. So it needs a, the basic options it needs is a remote host or host. So I need to set that value. So that is set or host, and I think it's just or host, or host to 192.168.128. Dot 129, I think that one was. And if we just do that, that's done, right? I'll just do exploit. And we wait for the magic. Dun dun dun. Dun dun dun. Found shell. Found shell opened. I now have a command shell on the metasploitable box. So if I do, now if I just do return and do sessions, I think minus I, I don't know if you even have to do this. Okay, sorry, maybe just do who am I? I'm root, meaning I am God, or a really odd thing in, in Australia. And if I do uh, uname, it tells me Linux. I think it's uname dash, is it uname dash A? I'm running on Linux, metasploitable 2.6.12, blah, 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 and I'm running as root. What can't I do? Very little. So at this point, I own this machine, okay? It's my thing to play with, I can do whatever I like. So I'm just gonna quit that. But that's just an example of how easy it is. Exit, maybe. That's how easy it is to remotely exploit a machine once you find out it has a vulnerable backdoor or a vulnerable piece of software. So this should be an example to you as developers who are deploying on applications and go, oh, we don't need to apply Windows updates. I always love the, the, the guys who go, Whoa. Um, who'd say, you know, we apply updates one month after the update cycle, okay? This to me is always the most insane thing I've ever heard, except when it's dealing with SharePoint, because that's just really dangerous. <laughs> Don't ask me how I know this. Um, the other thing is, what is really cool about the second Tuesday of every month? It's Microsoft's Patch Tuesday. What is really cool about the second Wednesday of every month? It's Rollback Wednesday. <laughs> There's my MVP gone. Anyway, <laughs> so what happens is people will get the patch and look at the patch notes, will re uh, re uh, sorry, reverse engineer the patch, figure out what has to go wrong, and then say, OK, we need to, we need to fix this, and this, is how we, and this is how we break it. Now, I want to show, I'm running at a bit lower, less, less of time today, so I'm going to try and do something pretty awesome today. So I want to show you, if you think ZenMap and everything else is difficult, then we have this thing called Armitage. It blends ZenMap and Metasploit into one nice UI. It even has this amazing thing up here in the corner called a tax called Find the Tax. 
you press it, it will do things. It will go looking for the different attacks that can be used against all the software or all the different de uh, devices on your network. You can use Nmap to just do host and Nmap scan exact same way as what we've just done. Find out the different uh, applications that are vulnerable, find different things, and then use this nice thing because if you didn't know that VSFTBD 2.3.4 was vulnerable, this will find it for you. Now, I'm going to wait until this does something because this is pretty cool what happens. Come on, baby. Right. You will now see an attack menu attached to each host in the target's window. Happy hunting. All right. So here on one, this on here, we can do attack FTP, and it should do this exactly the way. All right. It will do everything automatically. We click launch. We hopefully everything launches according to plan. Come on. Excellent. Wait for it. Wait for it. Boom. Ooh. Lightning. Now, that's when you know you're a hacker. Because that uh, when I did the Metasploit ping, everyone goes, oh, yeah, that's fine. But red lightning around to your computer, that usually gets a round of applause. Hint, hint. Hey! <laughs> And I can interact with the exact same way. I do want to point out one thing, because this is always gets a laugh out of everyone. You have this thing called a Hail Mary. Everyone know what a Hail Mary is? You throw the ball, you hope to God somebody catches it. But what I think is really cool is the way they've, they've stated it here. It says, once started, the Hail Mary will launch a flood of exploits at the host in the current workspace. There is nothing stealthy about this action. If clumsy launching hundreds of exploits is what you would like to do, press yes. <laughs> No, I, last time I tried and did this, the it broke the internet more than Kim Kardashian's ass. This was just really bad. No. Um, so at this point, you can. this is how very simple, where you've got two or three different tools being plugged together to make it much easier for you to do the exact same job. This is like when I tell people how to do SQL, and they're trying to learn how to do joins and different things, and I show them how you should learn how to do it. And then I go into SQL Manager, and I show them how to do views. And then it shows them how to do all the different joins very much simpler. So this is a very cool tool if you kind of find the Zen map or Metasploit's a bit difficult, or if you don't have your, a really good knowledge of the exploit DB in your head. Right. Now, I am going to, I'm, I'm probably going to skip the malware bit because I really want to just show, or I might see if I can just show a small bit. We'll do the malware bit then. So what I want to try and do is a bit of malware concepts here. And I'm going to show you what happens when you exploit a Windows 10 machine. And I hope all this goes according to plan. So I'm just going to check in Windows 10. So I have Windows 10, please, here. Yep, sorry. Uh, downloads, and I have a page. Yeah. So what I would normally do is I'd create use Veil to create a payload, um, which just allows you. It's a very similar to how uh, stuff works. And what I want to do is I'm going to create a new payload here. In using Veil, so I'll just do cd forward slash opt. You can download Veil from GitHub, and I just installed it into the tools. Veil, Veil Evasion, Evasion, and forward slash Veil. You will know this was written by a Windows programmer because it's capitalized. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Every single tool I use is lowercase except Veil. And it's really odd. It always kind of cracks me up. But it's very, very similar. It just uses the Veil framework. You have, like, for example, if we list here, I've got 51 different ways of and creating shell codes that do things. And what I plan to do is run a handler. I just need to find out where it is. Uh, other locations. This is always how you know I am not really good at this stuff. Uh -huh. It's not in var. Where is it again? Ooh, go back. It's in user share, I think, isn't it? Uh, any questions while I'm just frantically going around the internet here? Anything at all? Veil output. And then there's the handlers, and I think I've got pay two here. I just want to get that list. Okay. So it's user share, right? So what I'm going to do is normally I would create this, but I want to just do a handler and just get this running for you. And I want to show you what happens when you break minus or forward slash var. Uh, no, is it user share? Is that right? Share uh, veil. Output handlers, pay two, isn't it? Handler, we see. Great. So what I'm going to do now is this is a handler file. It basically sets up Metasploit to listen for everything for me and say, OK, now when you do something naughty on the internet, I'll be listening for you. And I'll, when it, you're that computer that's infected with your little val, uh, virus or, or malware or whatever, I will then send a new payload to it. So what I'm going to do here is on Windows 10, 
I'm going to show you something. You just go run as administrator because everybody should run things as administrator. <laughs> All right? And a blank screen is going to pop up, hopefully according to plan, because it's a batch file. Because the thing is, I wrote the original version with the, um, um, if we go back into Windows, into Linux, it should start uh, listening for this now, if everything is going according to plan. Come on, this worked a lot quicker upstairs. Panic, panic, do something else. Come on. Panic a bit more. Yes, no, did it? Did I get the right hander? I should have got it done, it should have just run. Oh, this was working upstairs. It might be just a bit odd what's going on. Because normally what happens is here, and this is where I'm going to just get really annoyed with myself now, but I'll just do it. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'll do another demo in a second. Normally what would happen here is the payload would just connect back up. Uh, it would send the payload to Metasploit, or from Metasploit to the machine, and then you'd be able to take over the do remote control of the machine. God knows why it's uh, done this. I have done it upstairs with a, a thing. If you want to see this afterwards, I'll probably be able to demo it no problem because there'll be no cameras, nothing going wrong, and the computer will go, oh, go. holy. <laughs> Sorry, it's gone on the Australian internet. <laughs> <laughs> it's gone over to New Zealand. Now, I probably have two shells. OK, cool. So ignore the little bit. We can cut that, right? Uh, Jacob, please. <laughs> so now I think I've got failed to launch something like that. OK, let's see what we have here. Yeah. Good. Sessions. If I've got two sessions, this will be pretty cool. I've got two sessions. <laughs> so now you can see that I've got a interpreter session back to desktop demo user on this particular one. I think the, cert the first one we ran as an administrator, so I'm going to do that. Because that is, you know what you say is, you know that this thing that pops up from IE says, are you sure you want to run this file? Sure, I want to just next, 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 and finish, and I'm done. And then it'll say, you want administrator rights, and you go, fine, just take whatever you need. I want to play games. This is the type of thing you exploit with this. So sessions minus I1, so we're going to get collected to the first session. We are now connected back to Windows. Just to just prove a thing of it is, I'm just going to do a PS. Uh, should do starting with PS. Oh, sorry. Is it, what's the, uh, is it, I thought it was PS was the command line for this. But I'm going to just do load ESPA. And this is loading an extension called uh, ESPA, which will allow me to do a screen grab of the desktop. If I do screen grab, it should now pick up the desktop of my computer. Isn't that pretty awesome? Now, we can also do things like, for example, um, keylogger. Is it key? Oh, what have I to do for that one? Load incognito. I'm having a bit of a problem why this is running a bit slow. Please don't be dying. Load. OK, we'll try and do the, screen, the key card, this help. There we go. So I've got screen grab, hash dump, get system. I've also got things like, for example, get system is a really cool thing. What it allows you to do is run as administrator. So if we do that, we're already running as admin. And if I go a little bit further up, I should be able to see, like, for example, um, I think it's at load uh, incognito. What incognito does is it's pretty awesome because we can run and log in as administrator or create new users for ourselves to do mad things. But this is just an example of what happens when you do crazy things against people's computers. My last one, before I go, because I've got five minutes, and I really want to do this one because I think this is probably one of the, the coolest demos on the planet because no one has any idea what's going on, especially me. Right. We will go over here, open up a new terminal, new window. So I'm going to do cd Kali scripts demo, and I'm going to do dot forward slash m, no, dot forward slash mitm.sh. This is a man in the middle attack. It runs a thing called the man in the middle framework. How many of you have seen Troy and he does like HSTS, strict transport security? There is a bypass for this, but it requires a very specific way of doing things. So what the man in the middle framework does is allows me to do an ARP spoof against a particular client, which means that now, instead of you routing out through the gateway, you're routing through me. I've just done my pineapple trick, except I'm on the same network as you, and now I'm going to run a DNS server, an SMB server, and different things, and do SSL strip against different applications. And what I'm hoping will happen is, when I bring up this, and we can go out to the internet, I'm going to show you what happens when a bank does it right, if everything goes according to plan. 
So your browsing session did not do that. Okay. Hopefully everything is going happy. We still have internet access. And we should be able to see something about Kenya and Ikea. I don't know what this is, but apparently it's a big thing here because this is the other thing. When you, you travel a bit, you get, oh, good. The people who help pedophiles, that's awesome. Not what I want to be doing in a black hat talk. Um, <laughs> dark humor, Niall. Um, www.google.com. Now, if everything goes according to plan, it did. Brilliant. Ladies and gentlemen, the Google homepage. Hey, you get a tenor later. Now, <laughs> what did I just do? An extra w. Oh, good eye. There's an extra W. So all the people are going, what, what, W? Where in the Google is there W? <laughs> www.google.com, all right? Now, it's also over HTTP, plain text. And even cooler is this is live. So if I want to go into sign in, for example, and if this goes according to plan, I will be in HTTP account.google.com again over HTTP. All right, you with me still? Good. Let's enter my email, nile.merrigan. Yeah, that's me. And we click next. And I'm going to put in pass one, two, three, four. I've called this out so you can hack it. And I'm going to click sign in. I didn't even think about it in one, two, three, four. Right? Nothing, the password you entered is, doesn't match. Nile.merrigan, password is pass234. What the bloody hell did the Irishman just do? Did he just break Google? No, he didn't. He exploited a very specific thing. A, the browser wasn't cached, all right? The browser doesn't recognize HSTS, therefore something is gonna, I can mess with the transport layer. So I've just removed SSL, I now can get stuff over uh, HTTP, and I want to do one last demo because I think this is pretty cool. And I think is at www.anz.com. Personal banking. Because this is an example of a company doing it right, even with my stupid stuff dicking around in the background. And if everything comes up and it may not come up, but what you do is if you run this attack on ANZ, what will happen is when I try and do login here, something really cool happens. All right? This page must be viewed over a secure channel. Boom, that company's done it right. Because they do not allow HTTP at all. And that is really cool when I see that, because that means the banks have done it right. They haven't got a HTTP um, uh, listener. They are doing this. And when I was, I'm super happy when I saw that. So fair play and kudos to those devs. But this is exactly what you want to see, this type of error. Now, this type of attack is brilliant when you're inside an internet cafe because no one will see it coming. Because you may not even see what just happened. All right? So be very careful. If you, got, if you are an untrusted network, i.e. it's not your own or it's not your corp, proxy, root, uh, VPNs out, whatever you have to do, do not trust that the network here. Now, after this talk, I'm assuming all of you will be asking me what VPN you want. I recommend Freedom. It's a fantastic one. And I use it all the time, even when I'm, on tra when I'm traveling. And I'm just bang out of time for about one more minute. So I will take questions. A stunned silence. All right, try again. Do you want to throw a shrimp on the barbie? <laughs> Sorry, I, that was just a, that was like a cockney uh, Australian accent. Uh, any questions, comments? Yes, sir. Uh, the HTTPS attack. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you are a smart man. Well done, you. So the question is, would this work in Chrome? No, it would not. Because the, the big thing is we've got a, a list called the HSTS preload list, what she, the, this gentleman is uh, telling about. And what that means is it is a list of a, uh, sites that are preloaded into, um, into Chrome and any of the Chromium-based browsers, which means they will not ever request over HTTP, ever. This, they, they, it's a bypass. I found this out to my horror when I was working with Visual Studio and I had set up HTT, HSTS for localhost and couldn't understand why it, I couldn't make a standard HTTP request. So HSTS 
on a preload doesn't this this is uh, this is not vulnerable to this. It's, uh, this the Chrome so Chrome will not be affected. IE eleven is affected because it doesn't have HSTS and preload, but uh, uh, Edge and IE twelve definitely will uh, support that and anything in Firefox. So this is a very much an Edge case. Please respond. So um, yes, Any, anyone else? Going once, going twice. Go get some coffee. Thank you very much. <laughs>